Hi, my name is Andre Jick. Hope you're doing great. Hope you're feeling well. Come for the finance and stay for the magic. I think I got it right this time. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Today I wanted to talk about something that I usually don't talk about on my channel, which is real estate. But first, a little disclaimer. Usually I try to stay in my lane of competence, which is something I feel like I'm somewhat good at. But real estate isn't something I have a particular grip or expertise about because I'm not a real estate licensed professional. I don't own any real estate investment properties. In fact, I don't even own my own house and I'm still a renter, but I've been looking for the past six years to begin and to finally start being a real estate investor. So now that I've disqualified myself from the get-go, I just wanted to be honest with you, but mostly with myself. And I just wanna remind you that I'm just some random person on YouTube who's about to give you his thoughts on a very complicated issue that I think affects all of us. So with that said, <laughs> let's finally start the video. Now it's no secret that I've been wanting to buy a house for a while now. In fact, some of my friends have started buying in the Las Vegas area, starting with my friend Jeremy, who also has a YouTube channel called Financial Education. And he bought a house in the Summerlin area worth over $1 million, and it's a beautiful house. But then my other friend who also does YouTube, Graham Stephan, bought a house literally right next door to Jeremy's. So we were all kidding that if I buy a house right next door to them, we could start a finance street for YouTubers. Now, as funny as that sounds, Keeping up with the Jones is real and the pressure is on. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I've been wanting to buy a house for a while now with prices ranging anywhere between the $200,000 range all the way up to $1.6 million. But in today's video, I wanted to share with you my thoughts on where I think real estate is gonna go, followed by why I think it's gonna go there. Spoiler alert, it's not looking good. And then I wanna offer up a solution in case you're in my same predicament where you wanna buy a house, but you're not sure whether you should wait or you should buy it right now. So having said all that, I wanna first give credit where credit is due and give big thanks to Ken McElroy, who inspired my video idea with his real estate video, which was, believe it or not, a response to meet Kevin's video about real estate. So having said all that, let's get started with the problem. I believe we're gonna have a real estate crash sometime in the year 2021, potentially in the year 2022. Now, one of the sources that I use for my real estate data is blacknightinc.com. Now, these guys are great. They're periodically putting out real estate market data that has everything to do with delinquency rates, forbearance rates, and even prepayment rates. But first, let's talk about delinquencies. Now, for those unaware, delinquencies happen when you miss a monthly mortgage payment. Payment. That's not to be confused with a default though, which is what happens after you're delinquent for a while, after which point your loan then goes into default. Now, different types of loans have different time periods after which you miss that they'll be officially considered in default. For example, if you have federal student loans and you miss a payment, it won't officially go into default until 270 days after your first missed payment. Now, when it comes to credit cards, that time is even shorter at 180 days after your first missed payment. But when it comes to auto loans and mortgages, that's only 30 days after your first missed payment. Now, once your loan actually goes into default, you can actually still catch up because there's still a grace period. For example, when it comes to student loans, you have 90 days for that grace period. But when it comes to mortgages, that is only 15 days. But when it comes to credit cards, you can actually miss one payment entirely, but as long as you call them and you let them know, they'll forgive you entirely. I've actually had to do this, so now I've got zero lives left. So back to real estate. If those delinquencies get turned into defaults, that's when they typically get sent to the collection agencies, which is when you'll see your credit score drop pretty substantially. So to avoid that from happening, besides obviously paying on time, people refinance their homes to make their mortgages cheaper and much more affordable. It's also why in 2020, we're gonna see more than 9 million home refinances according to Black Knight's research, which is the most that we've ever seen. So if you're in that situation and you're thinking about refinancing your home, then definitely take advantage of that right now, now's the best time to do that. But even though we've had all these positive signals like delinquencies down 3.3%, making it the lowest since March of this year, even though we are down 64,000 serious delinquencies, which is an improvement, we are still up nearly twice as much as the start of 2020. We still have over 1.8 million serious delinquencies on our hands, which is five times higher than before the pandemic started. So yes, while numbers are improving slightly, you still don't wanna be the kid that gets the most improved 
Award. Now, October is actually the latest data that we have from Black Knight, but typically speaking, delinquency rates go up from October to November. So the next time they publish their report for November, there's a chance that we could see delinquency rates go up by as much as 4%. And if you're a real estate investor and you're wondering which are the best cities to take advantage of for this, then the top five are Las Vegas, Miami, Orlando, New Orleans, and New York. Those five cities are probably going to see the biggest declines in prices. So that's the foundation that we're sitting on right now. That is our reality. Improving, but still not looking very good. But above the surface is what I like to call the narrative. And I think the narrative is we're gonna to be told to continue to buy real estate, to hold on to it for a very long time, to get in while interest rates are low and while supplies last. And while I think that is generally very, very good advice, I think this time around, it's slightly disconnected from reality. Not to be a pessimist, but here's what I think. Before we see a substantial drop in real estate, we're gonna see upticks in certain markets, like Las Vegas, for example, whose economy, by the way, is very fragile based on tourism and entertainment. And we are struggling at the moment, and yet we continue to defy economics because more and more people from LA, San Francisco, and New York continue to move here. I also think prices are gonna continue being boosted because the government is going to extend forbearance periods, we're gonna get more unemployment benefits and even more stimulus checks. But all of these price increases are temporary boosts in optimism. There's only so much we can drop the interest rate by before we can't drop any lower unless we go negative, where the Federal Reserve has already told us that they don't wanna do. But this is especially gonna be true for the luxury real estate market, which is gonna to continue to go up in price and we're gonna to continue to see lower inventory levels because the rich people have already realized that their dollar buys them less. And so to prevent that, to protect themselves from inflation, they're borrowing cheap debt. Because for a rare moment in history, it makes more sense for the people with actual cash flow to borrow money because they can get in at a lower interest rate than the rate of inflation. So it's almost like a way of shorting the dollar, where they're gonna then use that debt and leverage it to buy in states that, let's say, have no state income taxes or in world real estate places like Hawaii with a very finite limited supply. But again, all of that is a short-term narrative that's gonna help us stay afloat, but just for a little bit, because the long-term outlook is not so good, and it's gonna depend on two major factors, and that is jobs and government. For starters, there's government. Now there's gonna be a wave of forbearances that expire at the end of December. And many of them, in fact, most are reaching their nine month period. And remember, you get one year of a forbearance period. So let's assume that most of those people extend an additional three months, making that full one year. That puts us to around the March, 2021 timeframe. And let's assume that those people can't catch up on those payments. Well, if you can't catch up, you get one more month of a delinquency period, after which point your loan then goes into default. Default. Now, all of that puts us around the April, May timeframe. And before then, there's probably not gonna be that much more exciting things going on. So we'll know by around the April, May timeframe, the actual damage that we can assess. And that's, we'll have a better idea of where 2021 is actually headed. But regardless, logic is pointing us in the direction that inventory levels are going to increase, which should in theory, drop prices. The second factor is jobs, which is something that I've talked about before in my videos, which I don't see very many people discussing. But to summarize, the World Economic Forum predicts that we are going to lose 85 million jobs in just five years by the year 2025. But we're also gonna gain 97 million jobs, which is great because we're gonna get more. But unfortunately, creating jobs is a process that requires more friction and it just takes longer. But getting rid of jobs happens much more quickly. And so my fear is that we get something called a double disruption event, which happens when you get an influx of those new jobs and people are just not ready for them because there's going to be a disproportionate demand from the tech space and not everyone is going to evolve and be prepared and take on those jobs. So that coupled with the effects of the pandemic with small businesses closing and people losing their jobs permanently could mean that things could be very bad. Remember, it's not like 2025 hits and then boom, all of a sudden we lose tens of millions of jobs. It doesn't work that way. It happens over time and it's only going to increase at the rate with which we're losing jobs. And the people that are the least skilled and the least resourceful and the least prepared are going to suffer the most. But what's interesting to me about all of this and trying to predict where the real estate market is going or where the stock market is going or where the economy is going, I try to think of it as sort of like a scientist. 
even though I'm not one, but I'd like to think of myself as one. Because when we try to look at the age of the Earth, for example, we use all the different sciences to try to come to a consensus model of how old the Earth actually is. So for example, we will look at fossil records. We will look at chemistry. We'll look at carbon dating. We'll look at geology and how erosion plays into all of it. We'll use physics to try to use the time scales to see how long it takes for planets to form. And so together, we get a clear picture of how old the Earth is. And that's similar to how economics works as well, because no single factor can tell us where we're gonna go. We can't just use the stock market or just use the real estate market to try to determine that. So if we look at all the different studies in economics, we can try to sort of point ourselves in the right direction. So for example, when we look at the digital currency market and gold, those are booming. <laughs> that's typically not a good sign for a healthy economy. When we look at real estate and Black Knight research, they're telling us about forbearance expirations and delinquency rates going up, also not a good sign. When we look at the government giving stimulus to the people, not a good sign. We look at businesses shutting down, not a good sign. When we look at the Federal Reserve warning us about what could potentially happen to inflation, all of that, not a good sign. So while we don't see the face of what this is, we're definitely seeing and we're starting to sort of see the silhouette behind where we're going and we're orienting ourselves in the right direction. So I'm not trying to prophesize the end of times, but I do believe in hoping for the best, but planning for the worst. So as far as what I'm doing with my investing strategy with real estate, this is what this amateur is doing right now. I wanna wait and see what happens after the forbearance period plays out before I buy a house for myself. And that's gonna be sometime between April and May and maybe later throughout the year. But I think especially what Ken McElroy said is 100% spot on the money when he said that a lot of people are going to be displaced as they lose their homes due to the eviction crisis. And many of them are gonna start being renters. So there's going to be a huge demand for rental properties. Now for a lot of us, 2020 has sort of changed the way we think about buying a house because now we know there's a reality that exists in which the government can sort of force us to stay home and be very miserable. So many people are leaving those larger cities and leaving behind their small crammed apartments in favor of the suburban lifestyle where they can get a house that's basically twice the size for essentially the same price. And that's why we're seeing 14.2% up year over year on single family homes in comparison comparison to apartments, condos, and townhomes. So as far as actual practical investing goes, here's what I'm doing. I am buying inflation protected assets over the course of 2021. That's because the Federal Reserve has targeted a 2% annual inflation rate, but historically they've had a difficult time getting up to that 2%. So I actually found a Charles Schwab study that ranked all the different investment classes based on the inflation rate historically. So for example, if the inflation rate is above 4% per year, then the best performing asset class that year was actually gold, which was only second to commodities, which are things like gas and oil, which I have plenty of stocks in, so I'm good there. So because I don't actually like gold because I think it's boring and I'm a young whippersnapper who only likes technology, I invest in BTC. And just for the sake of transparency, this is still my portfolio. Again, it fluctuates like crazy up and down, but I'm still adding to it whenever I see opportunity. And I do think that in the next five to 10 years, it will easily outperform any other asset class bar none. I 100% believe that. But if the Federal Reserve has a hard time meeting that 2% inflation rate, and it's below that, that same Charles Schwab study found that the best performing asset class that year was the S&P 500, which by the way, the stock for that is VOO. And you know this because the Roman numeral for five is V and then OO is zero zero. That's how you know that the S&P 500 is VOO. Really easy way to tell. Now my dividend portfolio is actually very similar to the S&P 500. In fact, almost all of my stocks are from there, except I get the added benefit of having more passive income. So when we get a clearer picture sometime in April or May timeframe, assuming the government doesn't step in and extend forbearances yet again, then I'll probably start buying real estate rental properties. Now, as much as I would love to be Graham and Jeremy's neighbor and buy myself a million dollar house, those guys have a far higher net worth, far more income, far more stability on social media, and they already have exposure to real estate, whereas I do not. So it doesn't make sense for me to just splurge and treat myself to a $1.6 million home when instead I should be buying four 
$400,000 properties that I could rent out, maybe live in one and rent the other three or rent the other four while I continue living in my $450 a month rental. So baby steps, I will eventually get there and then maybe someday I could treat myself to that million dollar house. That would be awesome. But I'd love to know your thoughts. Do you think I'm right in my hunch of where we're going or am I a complete idiot and I missed the boat? Which could, by the way, totally be the case. And if you'd like to get started with investing, you can get four free stocks from Webull. You have until December 14th to deposit $100 where two of those stocks could be valued up to $1,600 each. You can use my links down below or not. Just do it before the expiration date and while they still have money. You can get a fifth free stock from Robinhood and you can even get up to $250 free dollars of digital currencies using this link right here. You can also join my free Discord group. Follow me on Instagram. I post from time to time or reach out to me with my PO box down below. Love you. Thank you so much for watching my video. I will see you back here on Monday and Friday, sometimes a Wednesday. And I would seriously love to hear your thoughts about what you're doing with real estate. Are you buying or are you waiting? And in the meantime, please check out Ken McElroy's video about the real estate market. I think it's wonderful. I will leave it down below in the description. Love you. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.